speakers. Uh, but the, uh, before we get to that, we're going to get a background on uh, IMT Waterloo. We started in 2014. We're a networking group that thrives on shared knowledge. Um, you'll find that in the Waterloo region. Um, that's what makes the community grow and thrive, is that we continue to share knowledge with each other. Um, so can I get a show of hands of how many people, is this their first time here tonight? Wow, that's awesome, excellent. Thank you for coming out. One of the goals of our events is to meet somebody new. So um, hopefully you've already done a bit of that with the first networking session. We're going to hear the two speakers and then you can continue to network after that. And then um, that's, that's one of the goals of uh, what we do here as well as learn something new. So I always bring in guest speakers that have uh, exor uh, exciting stories to tell. Um, and then we, it's, it's awesome to learn, you know, what's kind of managing what's going on. So there's always different stories coming into these uh, events. Um, so yeah, be sure that you're, that I'm hoping that we can give you something new to learn tonight. We're going to hear from John Morris, and we're also going to hear from Carl Schrader. And uh, after that, stick around for the following uh, networking talks. Uh, tonight is possible because of Lazarus Institute, Lazarus uh, School of Business and Economics. So thanks, Graham, to the back, and, and Lazarus for uh, putting this together. Thank you so much. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome John Morris. Thank you. Make sure you got your mic good. something about uh, the Internet of Things is not a commodity, it's not a black box, and so we have to take a different approach. Uh, if uh, you have to leave before uh, the event is up, the uh, black uh, text on the right kind of summarizes everything. Know your product, know your customers, call a lot of people, ask them all to buy it. Validate and do it every day. I'm just curious, before we get going here, how many people are actually in sales or business development Wow, this is going to be a great audience. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm just going to take my notes. Now we want to jump in here in the beginning with a very, very specific business scenario. Now we do a lot of talking about the Internet of Things and the technology, which is enabling, etc. This is actually a real example. Uh, from a company called Verise, and I wanted to just highlight this as an example of what uh, the, the kind of situation where you can have a massive win with the Internet of Things. And it's very interesting to see uh, how this was achieved. This is actually in the United Kingdom uh, at, at Sainsbury's, which is like the Loblaws of the United Kingdom. And in this particular case, they had 73,000 uh, re retail refrigerator uh, cabinets, refrigeration cabinets, in all these different locations throughout the United Kingdom, and they had uh, fairly high maintenance on them, and maintenance costs, and then if a compressor would fail, of course, there's going to be some kind of uh, cost associated with that. So over a period of time, they went through uh, with the business partner, which is another interesting thing to note here, is that uh, domain knowledge is very, very important. Uh, they were working with some uh, uh, IoT uh, platform vendor, but the business partner was able to work with Sainsbury's to implement this refrigeration control system specifically to manage maintenance. Now, the format that you have here is basically a, uh, a scenario which you can kind of use maybe to profile something you're doing. We have a business case, and everybody talks about the business case. In this case, there's efficiency, there's metrics. And there's different measures. I'll draw your attention here to the business semantics. It's interesting. They had a sensor response model in here. This is the semantics that are at the core of the application. And sometimes we just think the Internet of Things, you just plug it in and away we go kind of thing. Um, a very important thing was the suppression of false positives. And this is an issue that we're going to raise a little bit later, the question of alarm fatigue, etc. cetera. Uh, and so this kind of approach uh, it is a nice way of summarizing everything. We also have a use case here. And let's, let's note, and this is important for startups, I think, what's the difference between a use case 
in a business <clears throat> excuse me, a business case, a use case is, yes, we can do it. A business case is, you should do it because someone's actually willing to pay for it. And just because you have one, of course, doesn't mean uh, that you have the other. Uh, I think one of the things I'd like to highlight here uh, is how domain-specific this is. Nobody buys the Internet of Things. It's the old marketing cliche, uh, the customer doesn't want drill bits, they <coughs> want holes. The customer doesn't want uh, a new roof, they want a dry living room kind of thing. So this is, this is, I think, something if you're coming up with fantastic technology for Internet of Things, you need to start thinking, and we'll go through this a little bit, you need to think very clearly on what are the end use cases and really profile them as far <coughs> as you can go. Now we're going to go a little bit further here on the whole question of uh, solution end patterns. Uh, if you're in the software development, you know what a software development pattern is. That is to say, there are lots of things that we do redo that uh, there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. We can uh, find a particular best practices for a given way of doing something, and we call that a pattern. And we, maybe we customize it a little bit. But then on the other hand, uh, there's also anti-patterns, that is to say, common ways of doing things badly. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to see, how, uh, I've collected uh, five of these uh, patterns here, um, where we're looking at uh, things that happen again and again and again, where it impairs the ability of the customer to see the value or to experience the success of the deployed product uh, because of all these uh, patterns that keep popping up. We're going to look just at one item as an example here. This is alarm fatigue. And alarm fatigue uh, is based on the principle that data and sensors are cheap, but business analysis and the willingness of your customer to pay for business analysis uh, it is a lot harder to come by. And what happens is that in, in sector after sector after sector, we see alarm fatigue popping up. And so I'm taking this as an example of a pattern that beyond your responsibility for technology, and I'm speaking with people earlier, you're doing some amazing things, as you would expect here in Waterloo, uh, around technology. But then we have to get beyond technology and start looking at some of these sophisticated issues or challenging issues. Alarm fatigue is the problem that doesn't go away. Now you think, for instance, in the healthcare, that uh, where if you go into an ICU, it's a persistent problem there for 20 years. And given what's at stake in healthcare, you'd think they'd figure it out. But in fact, it's getting worse. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, around that. So I wanted to just share this, uh, start off with a little bit, uh, not with the technology, but with the kind of solutions and the challenges of getting to solutions to get our headspace uh, oriented towards thinking about the customer. And that's going to be the theme as we go through here. <coughs> set theory for sales. It's kind of like we have a set of sellers and we have a set of buyers and they kind of want to date each other. But uh, the problem is that the channel between is a very noisy channel, very bad signal to noise ratio. And so everybody has to spend a lot of effort to find the person that they want to work with. Typically we think of this sort of uh, funnel as something associated uh, with sellers. You know, if you have a CRM system, you see this typical funnel. And we stuff a lot of names in the top. And then we look at uh, ways of engaging with them and filtering out. This is a massive filtering system. We get candidates. Eventually we come to a decision and maybe we do a deal. Don't forget, buyers are doing the same thing. How can you make it easier for buyers who are making lists of candidates, etc.? And people are saying, of course, that the buying process is changing so much and that uh, uh, buyers are going all the way through the selling process and making the choice ahead of time. I think it possibly could be a little bit exaggerated. So what's happening through the middle here, this is fundamental to the whole concept of sales, is you're taking a situation where in the Internet of Things, we're dealing with low information, uh, high, high risk, lots of uncertainty, or, or, or any kind of a, a sales situation. You're looking at low information, you're trying to increase the level of information until we get to, to a place 
where both parties be, uh, are, are willing to make uh, a positive decision there. And by the way, as we go through, we're going to have a theme of uh, reducing uncertainty. Because when you reduce uncertainty, then it's possible for somebody to buy from you. If they see a black box and, they're, and they have really very little understanding, little confidence, how can they possibly make a decision? Now, the interesting thing is, as in your ecosystem, as you go through and reduce uncertainty, it also has an impact on your validations. As you are engaging with your prospects, etc., um, then you're going to uh, find that you're, it positively impacts on your validation. Now, let's go to one and one. That was sort of set sales group, sort of an entire ecosystem of selling and buying. Let's just go to one-on-one uh, -on -one sales. This is a, a sales tune-up in two or three minutes. The fundamentals of sales, and the biggest cliche in sales is, sell me this pen. If you've seen The Wolf of Wall Street, there's a whole vignette in there on sell me this pen. You know, that's probably not a good reference for the profession of uh, selling. But uh, uh, interestingly enough, my first sales job at the, was at the Globe and Mail. And my manager, she said to me, well, my prospective manager said, sell me this pen. So what's the big deal about sell me this pen? Uh, it's because it's not about the pen. What's the right answer to sell me this pen? It's what do you what do you want to use the pen for? Yeah, the whole idea is think about the other person. This is if you if you remember one thing today, it's think about the other person. I think you know we probably have some sense of this, <clears throat> but it's interesting uh, how often uh, we forget about this. So we come up with a nice acronym. This is uh, uh, probably the, the the most known acronym in selling. I imagine a lot of people here are familiar with it. Features, advantages, and benefits. And you know, in, into the technical world, it match, matches very nicely to capabilities, use cases, and business cases. So the feature of the pen is that the ink never runs out. And the advantage is that you always be ready to uh, sign a contract. And maybe the benefit is uh, you become, uh, you go to a sales, you get a sales award or something like that. But this is the same thing with all the technology that you're building here is you have you work really really hard to build fantastic technology but then what is the advantage of having this technology how does it enable your customer to do something what is the benefit to the customer and by the way i put this to the power of n here because you can't just do it once sales is expensive you need to make lots of sales so if you're doing selling you have to do this again and again and again you have to figure out uh, how to do this now that's one to one, but we have to kind of we have to scale this up here. That now we're into one to many sales, and so uh, the FAB features advantage of that is hiding in the middle here. But this is a whole value chain in terms of uh, typical sales narrative. We have to find the prospect. That's sort of <coughs> external to the system we're talking about today. You know, you have your company strategy, etc., your marketing strategy, but this is really more focused exclusively on selling. So we need to find the prospect. But, okay, so we're tar targeting, say, um, logistics with uh, cold chain. How do we find them? And, and once we uh, need to find them, how do we connect to them? How do we earn a place at the table? You need to show value and credibility. And how fast can you do this? And then you build a story together. And then you close the deal. That's great. We're so excited you close the deal. And then, of course, we need to do it again and again and again. Um, now, the problem, though, is that uh, we're not in the free education business. Uh, you know, we think, close the deal. Yes, isn't sales about getting to yes? In fact, the, the first thing about selling, fundamentally, is getting to the no. And that's kind of a strange thing, but that's because we don't want to waste our time. And so we have this acronym here. It's a, a well-known acronym. This is the simplest way of systematizing your filtering process. Budget, authority, need, and time. So this is like sales 101, kind of. And don't, you have to qualify with your customer. Do they have a budget? Because you're not in the free education business. A lot of people are very curious about the Internet of Things, especially. It's pretty interesting stuff. But if they have no budget, call them back in six months. Are you speaking to the person who has the authority? You need to find this out. Don't waste your time. 
You know, and, and if you talk to 100 people and you only sell one, then maybe you, if you can be really efficient about pushing the other 99 aside, uh, that would be uh, a good thing. <clears throat> and then, of course, what's the timing on this? So let's keep going here. So now, are we ready to sell the Internet of Things? Uh, because we had a, a, we, we've learned about qualifying, we've learned a little bit about uh, closing. Uh, I, I didn't mention, you know, it's, it's very, very important. Another nice thing uh, that people say is, you have two years and one month, one month. So let's, uh, let's do a lot of uh, listening and maybe a little less talking. So are we ready now to sell the Internet of Things? And uh, the answer is no. We just learned about selling. We're all excited about being salespeople now. But it's not entirely relevant to the Internet of Things because we just learned how to sell a commodity. We learned how to sell a black box where there's high information and low risk. But the Internet of Things is low information and lots of uncertainty. And for the buyer, uh, there's a lot of risk. There, so bank doesn't really work the same way. No one has a budget for uncertainty. No one has a real need. Yes, let's bring on some uncertainty. I don't think you're going to find anybody like no. And so we're going to uh, we're going to kind of look now and see what can we say about the customer that we might actually want to work with. Now there's a lot of customers out there, and a lot of them are feeling existential stress. And uh, some customers are in industries where the entire industry is uh, uh, being disrupted. And fear can be a powerful motivator. Um, and uh, the problem is, though, that just because you're fearful doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, embrace the new, embrace the uncertainty of the Internet of Things. So let's see if we can find out uh, uh, some roadmaps to understanding um, uh, where we might find the individuals who, under pressure, they need our Internet of Things solution, but they're also willing to embrace. Now, I think everybody here is familiar with uh, Jeffrey Moore's uh, technology adoption uh, curve. Uh, and, and we know that we need to work with the visionaries <coughs> and the early adopters and the pragmatists and stuff like that. And um, I imagine <coughs> that probably most of you have read Crossing the Chasm, et cetera. Now, you're probably also familiar with the Gardner height curve. And isn't it amazing how it matches up here? Now, it makes really good sense that the Gardner height curve is basically, I, I call it uh, adoption signaling. You know, they call it the height curve. Um, and uh, it basically, it means something's coming out of the lab. We're really pumped about it. We think there's some momentum here. So it, and it matches up with the visionaries and the early adopters, and that's great. Now, uh, Gardner calls the big dip in the social signaling, you know, we're excited about this. They call it the trough of disillusionment. I think that's a little cynical, unfortunately. You know, that's just where uh, there was a lot of excitement stuff came out of the lab. We know something's going on, but now it's time to go to work. To productize, to do the business analysis and the engineering. I was speaking with a number of people here earlier. You guys are doing a lot of work and a lot of comment on exactly this. You have the raw technology, but there's a lot of work that it takes to make it into a real process. And so that's where the business analysis and the engineering uh, and the productization happens. Now, uh, Jeffrey Moore, after he wrote uh, Crossing the Chasm, he's written a new book, just came out about two years ago. He actually serialized it on uh, LinkedIn. And it's called uh, Zone to Win. It's the four zones. It's an amazing book. This is kind of like an x-ray of the motivations of executives and how they uh, are, are uh, their motivations for embracing change in an organization. And so this is kind of like a map of any organization, and probably Fortune 1000 given who we study. And on this column here, the first column, we have sustaining innovation. And uh, we have something called the performance zone. Now this is the performance zone. That's business as usual. That's the core business model of the company. And this is where 100% of the revenue and probably 90% of the expenses of a company uh, occur. And uh, the time frame there is a year. And most executives spend their whole working life in this box. 
And now, of course, you've got to keep efficient. You can't fall behind the curve. And so typically we're going to have uh, you know, an engineering group or an architecture group or something like that, uh, maybe driven by marketing down the productivity zone. They have a longer time frame, and they're uh, able to come up with ideas and new programs that are uh, tested out and pushed into the performance zone. Probably you're going to be selling to these people. I actually sold uh, something to uh, uh, in the performance zone because we were able to show that they had a payoff of less than a year. You said, okay, we can afford it. But if we go over to disruptive innovation, and uh, you know, there's so much in the press and, uh, and in social and whatnot, oh, no disruption. Jeffrey Moore thinks disruption happens for Fortune 1000 companies once in 10 years. So if that's your target, you better have deep pockets and lots of patience. Uh, because it's, it, this is the column of new business model. This column is where there's no, it's basically business as usual. But because it's disruptive, that's the new business model. And so what uh, large companies do typically is they go in the incubation zone. They, they make multiple bets. And I think some of them are happening here in, uh, in Waterloo. Um, you might sell to executives here where they have a time frame of maybe three, four, five years. Time frame here of uh, one to two, maybe a little bit more years. And up there, if you're speaking, most of the people you get on the phone are probably up here. You have to be very aware. So let's keep going here. So now we know who might be interested in a, a prospect for us uh, in, in terms of something that we might be uh, selling. This is we're targeting our early adopter engagements. And, and, and the key thing in here is uh, we don't want to, uh, the, the, these people want to see inside the black box. This is not a commodity. Now, I just want to refer to my notes here because I want to. Uh, address the issue of the lure of the generic. Now, this is an interesting thing: is that you know we've worked really hard to kind of understand the sales a little bit here, and now we understand uh, through um, you know Jeffrey Moore's uh, chart, etc., that we really need to understand the motivations of these executives, and we need to understand the benefits. And we've kind of left our technology behind a little bit, and that's okay. That's good sales theory. We're all good sales people now. Um, but the, 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 the problem is we call it the lure of the generic. Now what, now what does this mean? So uh, you're going to market and the marketing person says, you know, we can't talk about our technology. We're just going to talk about faster time to market and how you've got a great ROI. And other uh, sort of top uh, line metrics and benefits that really uh, resonate in the business suite and in the executive suite. But the problem is if you're a small company, that uh, your big competitors, the platform vendors, they can say return on investment and faster time to market and other things like that, 10,000 times louder than you can. So you're, you, and you, you can't even compete against smaller competitors because if you're both saying ROI, there's no distinction. You've turned yourself into a commodity. So our first step today was we kind of walked away from features and we realized we did salesperson, we didn't want to uh, um, uh, focus on, we really needed to think about the, the customer and, and their motivations and their benefits. Now, we need to turn around and bring back uh, the, uh, our technology. And I think this probably makes people happy in this room here. Um, how are we, what time did we start? Okay, good. So, the idea is, uh, that uh, if you're, you know, I imagine people get involved in, in startups in part because you love technology, and that's not a bad thing, it's a pretty exciting thing. So when I stand up here and, and kind of imply that maybe you shouldn't think about it so much, you know, that, I would imagine that's a little bit distressing, that thing. But the fact is that for the startup, you have to celebrate, <coughs> excuse me, you have to celebrate your technology. Uh, now, Ian has informed me that uh, Steve Blank, uh, uh, was in town uh, some time ago, and quite a few people here, I think. Um, how many attended the Steve Blank uh, event? I'm just curious. A, a couple of people. Um, if you uh, are familiar, with how, how many people have, uh, say, read Steve Blank's blog obsessively? Okay, and next year, uh, Ian, we got to make it. Read Steve Blank. He shares so much fantastic stuff. And he's a guy, he's come up, come up with uh, um, the uh, minimal, uh, minimum viable product, which you're all familiar with, of course, and it's also really emphasizing product market fit. 
Steve Blank is suggesting, what is a startup? A startup is a hypothesis. What else is it? And what the hypothesis is that we have a good idea that somebody's willing to buy, that, had, that we can scale in the marketplace and then maybe cash in or make a big company or something like that. And, and we're really excited about this. And so the whole idea from uh, Steve Blank is product market fit testing. And Mark and Jesus says the same thing. Is we're constant, and this is why at the beginning I'm saying always get out of the office, call people, talk to customers. You're going to learn amazing things when you talk to real people every day it's all about. And so we're testing our value proposition. We've crafted what we think you're going to be interested in. We have our features and our advantages and our benefits and whatever. What do you think? And so we are kind of where, and sometimes it's going to be painful. So we're constantly updating our value proposition and our customer, uh, customer validation. And behind the scenes, we're constantly ref uh, uh, refining our technology so that we have the minimum viable and no more. But how do they keep them sync? I call this the meaning in the middle. Let's look at it. On the left here, you have your software development agenda, starting with your architecture, hopefully. You got your code. This is what gets in the press. Coding gives a great thing, isn't it? What about business analysis? I think, you know, I think business analysis should get a little more attention in the press. But this is your software development agenda. Over here, uh, we have, uh, and this would also include sales, but this is the, uh, um, this is the validation stack, if you will, where we're working with customers to show that they really like the direction we're going. Maybe they get some skin in the game, they're going to participate in the proof of concept with us, et cetera. And in the middle, though, how do we synchronize between it? It's what we've been talking about already. We've got our capability. The capability, that's, say, that's the job to be done. We can actually do this. That's great. Uh, it totally matches to, uh, we can map, even map this to FAD, et cetera. We've got our use cases and our business cases. The use case, again, is we can do it. The business case is we should do it. And so this is mediating back and forth. And if you should be building your inventory, uh, and, and uh, my colleague here is going to talk about narrative, I think, later. This is very much narrative driven. And you need to be building up your stories so that you can get traction with customers. And it's all on the foundation of your code. But it's like a cycle going back and forth. So let's uh, look at some, so just to summarize there, we moved away from technology because it's very important to think about the customer. And then we realized that we're not selling a commodity, that the customer uh, uh, has a lot of uncertainty. We need to help them reduce that perception of risk. And so we're trying to reduce the uncertainty. We need to bring our technology back again because uh, it's not a black box. It's not a commodity yet. Let's look at some uh, sales tools here. Uh, we have about five of them. This is a pretty simple one. You know when you speak to somebody on the phone, uh, and, and you're working hard to get a meeting with them, um, it would be uh, a, a good idea to have a structured interview with them. When you go to a, a big meeting, you've worked really hard to get, and the sales engineer says, uh, by the way, are you guys not men or job? It's like, that's such a wasteful question. You know, it's my responsibility. I should have informed him ahead of time. So we have a structure to get the key business things don't have a meeting with someone if you, if, and then go and ask them these basic questions. Um, this is an interesting thing, a pre-demo checklist. By the way, what's the best advice on the demo? Don't do it. <laughs> it's too expensive. But if, if it's qualified, now we can use our, you know, we're salespeople now. We can, you can use our budget authority. We can qualify some way if it's a good idea to do this demo. Now let's say we're going to do the demo. Uh, you know, you don't want to go, there's a, there's a phrase that sometimes uses up, show up and throw up. Does that sound appetizing? Uh, that's, well, so many demos. I can never figure out, you know, I see a demo, they all look the same. You've got some mappings, uh, you've got some data entry screens, you've got a graph going up to the right and blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, it's like, we want to kind of pull it apart. Notice. Each of these lines maps back to a capability and a use case. It's like, because we did our work, 
And so we're going to do a demo. We want to let, it let our light shine. And so you make a pre-demo checklist. You share it with your customer. And then you interview them on the phone. And they say, you know what? I think number four, number five, that really takes the cake. But that's what we're going to look at. OK, great. So now we're going to have a big meeting. You know, maybe you should save money and not have a big meeting. Just have a little demo. Probably everybody in your company should be able to do the mini demo. But let's say there's a lot at stake and someone's really interested in your technology because uh, maybe uh, during one of these uh, startups from a large company that, that they're uh, trying to explore something. So you've got a lot of uh, big wigs here. You negotiated the agenda. You know what the next step is. Don't do it if you don't have the next step because, again, you're not in the free education business. So as you're figuring this out, it's like when you see this fantastic demo, what are we doing next? Well, in fact, uh, we have a new program coming in August, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and by the way, notice what the, at the top does it say? Does it say demo? It says demo and workshop. Don't do something like this if it's not interactive and in getting people involved. It's, it, it, and by the way, on the agenda there, they also have a slot to present to you. It's not just you going and presenting and we have uh, some PowerPoints, then we have uh, the demo, then we have the Q&A. No, you're going to get one of their senior executives to have a significant item on the, the uh, agenda ahead of time. And that's an amazing thing because you probably work with them. Um, you know, great movies have scripts. Does your demo have a script? I'm just curious if anybody in the room who does a demo that, that has a systematic script that they follow that they can share. Does anybody I just stick up your hand? I see a couple of people. This makes my heart very happy. This is fantastic. We have quite a few people. This is great. So uh, if you have a demo, this also maps back, of course, to your inventory of capabilities uh, and uh, uh, use cases and business cases. And uh, uh, we and it also maps back probably to the pre-demo checklist. And each of these items on the demo, this is uh, maybe the customer pick, you know, number four, this we're going to focus on. It has a little summary about it for the technical people in the room, it tells what are the technologies we're using, and maybe some interesting insights that distinguish you. It's all right there, and it's then uh, Kareem at the back of the room, he says, you know, how about number eight? You know, can you demo, de well, of course you can do number eight because you practiced the whole demo. Yeah, and, and so you did number four, and then you did number eight, and, and, they're, and now they're really excited. Uh, let's say eventually you're going to do a proof of concept. Now, what's the best advice about a proof of concept? Don't do it. Don't do it, right. Unless, <laughs> good, good, good. Okay, you, you get a gold star. Unless it's fully qualified. And you know, they, they need to have skin in the game here. If you're a small company. If somebody wants a proof of concept, you better be this close to having a serious business relationship with, it, with them. And if you have to customize this for them, then they should pay you, kind of thing. But you know, if, if uh, the, the idea though is that if you're doing a proof of concept, it's because you already know that there's a trial or a paid project afterwards. You knew that you've known this for months even. And this is just to prove it, your company, your, your prospect is, this technology can save our company. We hope it's true. That's what the proof is. We're going to prove our hope. And so uh, the, 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 you know ahead of time that when you're doing this proof of concept, that following that, once it's successful, then you're going to actually uh, uh, move on to a trial or something like that. And, and you've done the band thing all about that. You know that uh, the person has the, uh, has the authority and then they have a, some, a set aside budget for it. And the board of directors has specified that this problem's got to be solved. Now, great, <coughs> but how do we know if the proof of concept is a success? Well, you make it very, very clear. It's almost like a contract. This is an actual real Internet of Things uh, proof of concept decision criteria. We're going to capture your data. We're going to assess the data. This is actually in a manufacturing plan. Uh, we're going to trigger a response. Then we're, we're going to give you the opportunity to monitor in real time the situation, or whatever you want to do. And we're going to give you, in this case, the ability to adjust some parameters. 
And, and so this is negotiated with them is like, what's the minimum? This should be the minimum. <coughs> it, a, a proof of concept should not be something that's monastery. So that, that's the, the, the thing. Here we are again. We're all about selling the new. The selling the new is uh, in a situation of lots of uncertainty and low information. And so we've been working hard to kind of raise the level of the information and to engage with the customer and to help them uh, come to a positive situation where they feel comfortable making a decision because their risk has been reduced, their perception of risk has been reduced. Now, as, as by the way, as you're reducing the uncertainty in your system and you're getting validations here, uh, of course your valuation is, all, is all also going up. So uh, these are some of the, the things that we've uh, covered here today. Uh, it, the summary is this. Uh, know your product, know your customer, ask a lot of, uh, uh, call a lot of people and ask everybody to buy, ask everybody to validate, and don't sit in your office. Get out, and, and it's the most amazing thing uh, to talk with customers on the phone and uh, people you're developing a relationship. And I strongly encourage, I suspect a lot of people are doing this, try to up your game on that and do more. Okay, so does anybody have any questions for John? Yes, sir. Uh, it is well known that uh, uh, the startup's uh, success is a matter of uh, luck. Are you aware of any uh, attempts to engineer a success uh, of a startup? I think there's always an element of luck in any startup, but hard work and good strategy is going to make a difference. Does that make sense to you? Yes. We got one here. Hi. Uh, what are your thoughts on designing for distribution? You talked about selling to one, selling to many. What about distribution? I think they're in high with these and XIT. Canada has 7,500 IT resellers looking for the next thing. Distribution in Canada is building the IoT marketplace. What are your thoughts on that? That's a really important question. And uh, with the constraints of time, I didn't speak so much about uh, channels, which I think is a synonym for your use of the term distribution. It's incredibly important, especially for startups. And I'll think of, in particular, two reasons. Uh, number one is that can be a source of domain knowledge. Because, of course, when we saw the Sainsbury's uh, win at the be in the beginning, uh, it was very, very specific knowledge uh, about compressors and refrigeration and stuff, and stuff like that. That came from a business partner. And uh, it, that, uh, the, uh, the question of channel partners is very, very important. Also, not only for access to domain knowledge, but also to be able to scale your sales because direct sales, of course, is impossibly expensive. And the only way the small organization uh, is going to thrive, and I think everybody's probably aware of this in the room, is through a, an aggressive channels program. And of course, you need to look at the different channels mo models, whether it's OEM in terms of licensing, et cetera, uh, or uh, uh, a systems integrator, uh, independent software vendor, different kinds of models to familiarize yourself with the channel? It's a great question. Hello. Uh, first, let me thank you for just a brilliant presentation, one of the best I've seen in years. Uh, my question is really, you're, you've commented we're not in uh, the free education business. One of the challenges that we faced is when you're you're always asked to be different rather than better, always asked to innovate and come up with something new. We faced the challenge a few times where we've got a, something that solves a problem. We're trying to follow as many of those models that you talk about, but we've got a marketplace that doesn't know they have the problem. It's real. We can sh demonstrate it, but they don't understand it yet until somebody points it out to them. And how do you go about addressing that without engaging in the free education model that you talked about? 
th this is a terrific question. And I think uh, the um, I mentioned of alarm fatigue earlier possibly could be an example of this kind of uh, issue, a sort of a market uh, sub-optimization, a, a market failure, a persistent uh, um, failure of uh, buyers and companies to take on new technologies that could really give them uh, a great edge. Um, and, and then, of course, for a startup, not only is it not a question of uh, not being in the free education business, but uh, if, you, if you look at the giant corporations of the world that, that can afford to make a market, you know, the Amazons of the world, the Microsoft, um, and uh, th these are, and Googles, and Facebook, etc., in creating entire ecosystems, it's enormously expensive. And so, maybe a second answer, so that's sort of the, the negative thing, is that there are persistent uh, market problems of which alarm fatigue, which uh, uh, in um, uh, healthcare is a persistent problem. I'll just make a note here, Johns Hopkins University studied alarm fatigue. And apparently in some, uh, it's typical American in intensive care units to have between 300 and 700 um, alarm events per bed per day. It's like a beep, a message, uh, you know, um, a, a blinking light or whatever, a sound. And it's unbelievable. It's like the human cannot comprehend this. So you think in healthcare with, with people's lives at stake in ICU, that this would have been solved. In fact, it's getting worse. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I think this is a kind of a, uh, uh, a problem that doesn't go away. Maybe one uh, thing to look at is the uh, the adoption signaling curve, and kind of at, at least if you can't make the market yourself, despite your understanding of it, you know sometimes things happen. So keep an eye on where the uh, marketplace is going and the signals out there that maybe we do hit a tipping point for something. A lot of people are now beginning to address the alarm fatigue issue. Lovely uh, Gardner uh, Moore mashup, but uh, that was first for me. Um, and uh, so one of the questions I have is, is your early adopters are coming into the peak of your hype cycle. Um, and so how do you manage expectations while playing into that, uh, while the fact that you're also going to have to carry them through that trough? Like, what are thoughts and strategies around the selling into the hype, so to speak? Yeah, this, uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of the word hype there. That's why I changed the thing to adoption signaling. That's to say, you know, Gardner had they call it the trough of disillusionment, they call the whole thing a hype cycle. You know, and, and I think this is, these are very real social processes. You know, something in the lab comes out of the lab, and people realize there's incredible potential. And so we get excited about it. Sure, why not? There's especially people who have an engineering uh, orientation and stuff like that. And so we do a lot of chatter about it, and then we kind of, okay, we, we've done that. Now it's time to get to work to do the business analysis, to do the productization and the engineering and stuff like that. Um, and, and so I, it, uh, your question specifically was, how do you manage the hype? I, I think part of it is just to be realistic with people and not admit that it's hype. It's just a normal social process. And if people have lots of expectations, then you have to say, you know what? It's pretty exciting, but now you have to pay us for the business analysis and engineering to, to take it forward to full productization. Very cool. Anybody else want more? We're good. Thank you very much, John.